So, let, let us look at Bibo stability in some detail. Okay. Uh, any questions on the uh, examples and uh, the general conclusions which I drew from them? So, I am going to prove one of them. Okay. So, that, that is my uh, intention now. Yes. Okay. Any questions? Anything more? So, okay. So, let us uh, let's look at Bibo stability, right. So, we know that uh, y of s is uh, p of s times uh, u of s, right. So, uh, you give me any uh, plant transfer function, the output to an input u is going to be uh, p of s times u of s. This implies that uh, y of t is going to be equal to 0 to t p t minus tau u tau d tau right. So, I am using the convolution integral. Okay. So, let the magnitude of u of t be bounded by a positive real scalar m for all t greater than or equal to 0 right. Correct. Okay. Then what will happen? The magnitude of y of t is equal to the magnitude of z integral 0 to t p t minus tau u tau d tau. This is going to be first of all less than or equal to integral 0 to t the magnitude of p of tau magnitude of u of tau d tau. Do you agree? How did I get this? It is a property of the integral, right. So, so just to give an analogy, if you have let us say two scalars a and b and you add a plus b, right, let us say a and b are real numbers, right. So, a plus b, the magnitude of a plus b is going to be less than or equal to the magnitude of a plus magnitude of b, what we call as triangle inequality, right. So, a similar thing, right. So, because if you have an integral and you have the integrand, first on the left hand side I am taking the uh, absolute value of the entire integral, right. And that is going to be less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of the integrand, okay. So, that is what we are doing, right, okay. Now, this is going to be less than or equal to m times integral 0 to t, the magnitude of p t minus tau d tau. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah, m is greater than zero, right? Sorry. Yeah, this uh, this is a magnitude, right? So yeah, so uh, we uh, I, it was there in the slide, so that's why I didn't. Uh, uh, let me write it down. Okay, here m is a uh, finite positive real number. Anyway, I am, I am taking uh, taking the absolute value, right? So, absolute value of u of t, right? So, it is going to be a positive number, right? So, yeah. Okay. So, I hope it is clear. Okay. So, now, uh, please remember, what was p of t? It was what is called as the impulse response function, right? If you recall the physical uh, meaning of p of t, right? So, uh, question becomes, the question that we would ask ourselves is that when would the uh, magnitude of y of t uh, be bounded? Given this expression. So, given this expression, when do you think the magnitude of y of t will be bounded? See, uh, the magnitude of y of t is bounded by this integral, right, m times integral 0 to t magnitude of p t minus tau d tau. Now, suppose let us say this integral is bounded, right, certainly the magnitude of y of t is bounded, do not you agree? See, because magnitude of y of t is less than or equal to m times integral of 0 to t p t minus tau d tau, okay. So, the follow up question that I we would ask is that when is integral 0 to t magnitude of 
P of T minus tau D tau bounded. Correct? Isn't it? So, uh, when do you think uh, the integral of a non-negative integrand would be bounded? Why am I saying non-negative integrand? Because I am taking the absolute value of p of t minus tau, right? So, p of t minus tau anyway can be a real valued function, right? It can take positive or negative values. But then once I take the absolute value, it is going to be non-negative. Why am I saying non-negative? It can be greater than 0 or equal to 0 also, right? So, p of t minus tau, the absolute value of it is going to be a non-negative function. So, I am taking the integral of a non-negative integrand. When do you think this integral will be bounded? Only when limit t tending to infinity magnitude of p of t is equal to 0. See, otherwise, you know, like if this limit does not go to 0, see, integration like is like sum, right? If p of t does not go to 0, right? What do you have? What happens if you keep on integrating? The number is only going to increase, right? So, for example, uh, let me just give you a simple illustration, right? Because uh, magnitude of p of t, uh, let us plot it, okay? So, let us say magnitude of p of t goes something like this, and then like it settles down to a non negative value. What is going to happen? Integral is just the area, right? So, what will happen is t, although the magnitude of p of t is bounded, the integral is going to become unbounded as t tends to infinity. What is the only scenario when the integral will be bounded, when the area will be bounded? Only when the function itself goes to 0 as t tends to infinity, right? So, this is the condition. So, we can immediately see that this implies that magnitude of y of t is bounded for all time if limit t tending to infinity p of t is equal to 0. Okay? So, this is a sufficient condition for Bibo stability. Right? It says that look you give me the impulse response okay? and if the impulse response decays to 0 as time t tends to infinity then my system is Bibo stable. Okay? But then okay, this is a good concept. But still, we are not there, right? So, because if I want to test it, test a system using impulse response, we know the difficulty uh, that we would face, right? Because it is very difficult to generate an ideal impulse, right? So, then how do I get the impulse response? How do I test the system for its stability? Okay? So, that is going to be a question, right? So, now what is, can there be an equivalent criteria for this? Yes, there is and it is based on poles. Okay? So, that is what we are going to uh, look at. Okay? So, let us see you know like how we get an equivalent criteria. Okay? We are only done with half the derivation. Right? I hope it is clear till this point. Right? We want to figure out when the system will be uh, Bibo stable for a bounded input. Right? For any bounded input, when will the output be bounded? We figure out that the output is bounded if the uh, what I say, uh, the limit of the magnitude of the impulse response goes to 0 as t tends to infinity. Okay? Now, let us go further. Right? Okay. We already know that p of s is going to be equal to n of s divided by d of s. Right? This is the plant transfer function. Right? And the Laplace of p of t is going to be equal to p of s. This is also something which we know. Right? So, let there be k distinct poles of p of s okay let the multiplicity of the pole s i Okay, S i, i going from 1 through k, b mu i. Okay? So, okay, the system order is n. Okay? 
So, the order of the system is anyway n, right? That is a general notation anyway we are following, right? The order of system is n. So, this implies that there are going to be n poles, right? Of the transfer function. That is something which we already know, right? We are dealing with a generic case, nth order system, okay? So, let us say out of these n poles, let k be distinct, okay? I am doing a generic case, okay? Of course, all n can be distinct. That is also okay, right. So, in a few examples, we would have seen that you know, like uh, the poles were distinct, there are no repeating poles, but there can be repeating poles also, right. We are just uh, doing the generic case. I am saying, like, let there be k uh, distinct poles, kl being less than or equal to n, right, okay, and let the multiplicity of the pole, okay, I missed the word pole, okay, si be uh, mu i, okay. What is meant by multiplicity? The number of times it repeats. Okay, if it is non-repeating, multiplicity is 1. So, this implies that summation i going from 1 to k mu i should be equal to n, right, correct. Let us say if I have a 10th order system and let us say, you know, like I have 9 non-repeating poles with the 9th pole repeating twice, right, summation of the multiplicity should be 10, right. So, that I cannot violate, right, fine. So, essentially the summation of the multiplicity should be equal to the order of the system, which is the total number of poles, correct? Okay. Now, immediately we see that P of t, which is the Laplace inverse of P of s, can be uh, written in this particular form, okay. So, it is going to be the, uh, it is going to be n of s divided by uh, S plus, uh, okay, let me uh, see how I can change the notation. Okay, let us, that is okay. S plus SI, uh, whole, uh, sorry, S plus S1, whole to the power mu i, S plus S2, sorry, mu 1, right, S plus S2, mu 2, right, all the way till S plus S2, S, uh, K, Okay, to the power mu k, right? So, that is how this is going to come up, right? So, that is how I can split the denominator polynomial, right? I can factorize the denominator polynomial. Now, I need to take the uh, LCM, right? Now, how can I write the LCM? Uh, sorry, uh, I, I need to take the partial fraction expansion, right? How, how would the partial fraction expansion look in general? We did a few examples last time, right? So, uh, if you had a, uh, what to say, the uh, n, uh, if you had a repeating pole, what, what did we do? Let us say if we had a factor like 1 by s plus 1 whole square, what did we do? We did like a by s plus 1 plus b by s plus 1 whole square, right? So, you will have two terms, is not it? So, what is going to happen is that if when we do the partial fraction expansion, we are going to get something like this. Uh, let us say, let me call it as uh, L going from 1 to k, M going from 0 to mu uh, L minus 1, okay, some CLM which is the residue, right, divided by, okay, S plus S1 to the power, sorry, S plus S L to the power M plus 1, okay, that is what is going to happen, okay, because what is going to happen, you know, like let me give you an example as an aside. So, for example, I hope I did it correctly, let us double check, okay. See, for example, let us say I have a system uh, where uh, whose transfer function is this. All right, 1 by s plus 1 plus s plus 2 plus uh, times s plus 3 whole square, right. What is the order of the system? What do you think is the order of the system? See, the order of the system is the order of the uh, denominator polynomial of the transfer function, right. What is the order of the denominator polynomial? 4. So, n is going to be equal to 4, right. And what are the poles? It is going to be minus 1, 
minus 2, minus 3 and minus 3, right? There are 4 poles, but minus 3 repeats twice. So, what is the number of uh, uh, unique non-repeating poles k 3. So, then what, is, what are the values of mu 1, mu 2 and mu 3 which are the multiplicities of the 3 non-repeating poles? Mu 1 is going to be 1 which corresponds to minus 1, mu 2 is 1 which also corresponds to minus 2 and mu 3 is going to be 2. If you add mu 1 and mu 2 and mu 3 what do you get? You get 4 which is n, right. Now, if you want to do the partial fraction expansion what will we do? We will write a by s plus 1 plus b by s plus 2 plus c by s plus 3 plus d by s plus 3 whole square, is not it? That is what we would do, right. That is the same thing I have done in compact form, right, using the summation. So, I have uh, what to say essentially 3 unique poles, non-repeating poles and each pole I am summing inside once again, right, because uh, there can be multiplicities, right. So, that is what I am uh, doing here, right. So, essentially what we are done here is that a by s plus 1 uh, plus b by s plus 2 plus the c I can take it as m is equal to 0 to 1, right. Some uh, c uh, what to say uh, 3 m divided by s plus 3 whole to the power m plus 1, okay. That is what I have done, okay. If you expand that is what you will get, right. You will get 2 terms, right. That is what we have done. So, the c l m are the residues, okay. I am just putting 2 indices because I have 2 summations, right. That is it. What I called as a b c d, I am just calling as c subscript l m, okay. That is just the change in the notation. Okay, uh, because I have two indices uh, uh, L and M. I hope it's clear how we got it, right? Yeah. Sir, your question is MS by DS, right? So, uh, I'm sorry, P of is N S by D S. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm still in the complex domain. Thank you. Oh, please erase that. I'm sorry about that. Okay, this P of S. Okay, we are not taken the inverse Laplace transform yet. I I meant to. Write it separately, but I think I just uh, continued with it, right? So now, now we are going to come there, right? So now comes p of t equals uh, Laplace inverse of uh, p of s, right? Is it clear? Now we take the Laplace inverse. So now, in this particular problem, if I take Laplace inverse, you know, like what will I get? Let's continue with this problem, right? If I take p of t, I'm going to get a e power minus t uh, plus b e power minus 2t right plus c e power minus 3t then what is the Laplace of uh, 1 by s plus 3 whole square t e power minus 3t right once again we use the complex differentiation theorem we saw this uh, last week right so when we did the examples right that is going to be t e power minus 3. so now I am going to generalize from here right so, this implies that uh, p of t is going to be equal to summation l equals 1 to k summation m equals 0 to mu l minus 1 c l m right e power s sorry t power m right e power s l p okay I have just generalized from that. Okay, because you see that when uh, there is no multiplicity, there is no t term. Okay, because anyway you won't have the summation with respect to m. You will have a summation with respect to m only if you have multiplicity uh, greater than one, two, one above, right? So then you will have t power m. So for m equals zero, which is the case when you don't have any multiplicity. See, for example, for the pole at minus one, what is mu one? it is 1. So, what does it mean to say m equals summation m equals 0 to 0? You just use m equals 0 that is it, right. So, you will not get a t, t power term at all. Do you agree? Yeah. So, but then like for any case where the multiplicity is 2 and above, you would get a corresponding t term, 
right so that's what you we are going to have do you agree is everyone uh, what to say uh, in agreement with what i have written i i am just parallelly doing a example and then doing the general case so that we can map them okay yeah now once i get this so this means that the magnitude of p of t is going to be equal to the magnitude of summation l going from 1 to k m going from uh, 0 to mu l minus 1 c l m t power m e power s l t once again we use triangle inequality right so the absolute value of sum of numbers is going to be less than or equal to the sum of the individual absolute values right so what will i have <coughs> I will have this. Okay, do you agree? That is what we will have. Right? Okay. Now, you know, like uh, let us let us look at this further. Okay, S power L is going to be equal to sigma L plus j omega l okay because in general you can have the poles to be complex conjugates okay i am taking the lth pole okay which is sigma l plus j omega l if it's real the omega j omega l term is not there okay so what will be e power slt it's going to be equal to e power sigma l plus j omega l times t this is going to be equal to e power sigma lt e power j omega l t right because e power a plus b is going to be equal to e power a times e power b right so that is what we have. Now what can you say about the magnitude of e power s l t that is going to be only magnitude of e power sigma l t y because e power j omega l tell t magnitude is 1 right and e power sigma l t magnitude is anyway e power sigma l t right because anyway the exponential term is non negative right it can asymptotically go to 0 but it is uh, so I just remove the absolute sign is it clear how we got this simplification right. So we are almost there okay of course this was a long derivation right. So, see by and large I think this is the only proof I am going to do, okay. So, uh, in future we will make use of results, right. That is going to be the focus for this particular course. But at least I wanted to show you, okay, so that you understand how the inner details of whatever we are learning works, right. So, essentially this shows that uh, the magnitude of P of T is going to be equal to summation l going from 1 to k m going from 0 to mu l minus 1 uh, magnitude of c l m anyway t power m i can just write it as it is because anyway we are only taking the case t greater than or equal to 0 i can just write t power m and then this we got as e power sigma l t do you agree now if sigma l is strictly less than 0 for all L going from 1 to, to k, what can you say about uh, the magnitude of uh, P of t as t tends to infinity, it will go to 0, right. Because please see that, please note that the left hand side is less than or equal to the right hand side in the limit t tending to infinity if the right hand side goes to 0 obviously the left hand side has to go to 0 because the left hand side cannot take negative values right magnitude of p of t is non negative okay so the only choice for that is is that like magnitude of p of t should go to 0 okay so this implies that limit t tending to infinity the magnitude of p of t goes to 0 now immediately one may ask the question hey what about the t power m term 
right it so happens that the exponential term with the negative exponent will dominate the t power m term okay so the product will go to zero anyway right so it so turns out that you know like the sufficient condition for the uh, impulse response to asymptotically go to zero is that I have I, I need to have all poles to have negative real paths okay let us say k there are k distinct poles k can be less than or equal to n right. So, whatever poles are there all poles must have negative real paths okay or in other words we should have all poles lying in the left of complex plane okay yeah. yes please. Ah, okay. So, okay. Let me. Uh, I I just skip one one step there. Okay. So uh, so let shall I write here? So uh, if I take magnitude of s power l t, it's going to be equal to magnitude of uh, e power sigma l t, uh, e power j omega l t, right? So this is going to be magnitude of a times b. This is going to be magnitude of a times magnitude of b, right? So e power uh, sigma l t, uh, e power j omega l t right and what is e power j omega l t if I use uh, Euler's relationship it is going to be cos omega l t uh, plus uh, j sin uh, omega l t right. Now if I have to take the uh, magnitude of this complex exponential what do I do real square plus imaginary square square root what is cos square plus sin square 1 if I take the square root I will get 1 that is why it vanishes right it becomes 1 is it clear. Okay, good point. Okay, I, I I just skipped it. I hope it's clear to everyone now. Right? Yeah. So uh, to summarize, we see that this implies that if all poles of the uh, plant transfer function. in the LHP okay that is have negative real paths okay then the system is Bibo stable. Okay. Some people will say it is asymptotically stable. Okay. We are going to shortly see what that is. Okay. So, okay. so that is that's what it is. Okay. So, the uh, important condition here is that like I find the system transfer function and if all the poles of the system transfer function have negative real paths, okay. uh, that is even one uh, what to say the uh, what, uh, so that is if all poles ha are in the left off of complex plane left off of the imaginary axis right left of the imaginary axis in the s plane then we have uh, asymptotic stability or what we call as uh, bibo stability okay so uh, is this also necessary so what do i mean by necessary you know like we have only shown what is called a sufficiency condition right so uh, what we have shown okay if all poles lie in the left off plane we have shown that system is bibo stable now the opposite question arises if a system has to be bibo stable do all poles need to lie in the left off complex plane see i hope all of us understand necessary condition sufficient condition and necessary and <coughs> sufficient condition see if a is necessary for b to happen right that means that a needs to be true okay for b to happen that need not imply that only a is required for b to happen right so if we say a is sufficient for b to happen if a happens that means that even b will happen right but then b can happen due to other reasons also right so we do not know right so essentially what we have shown is that we have only shown that the sufficient condition for bibo stability is that all poles should lie in the left of complex plane now what is the other way around okay that is if a system 
what to say is Bibo stable, then all the poles lie in the left of complex plane, right? Is that true, right? So, is the uh, what to say the uh, is the condition of all poles lying the left of complex plane a necessary condition for Bibo stability? Why is necessary condition important? Only then we can talk about a corollary, right? Because if I say for Bibo stability, all poles being in the left of complex plane is necessary, then I can say that even if one pole lies in the right of plane, it's unstable. With this statement, I cannot show, right? Because let's let's look at this derivation, right? Now, if you tell me I have a system where one pole is in the right of complex plane, what will happen to the uh, uh, what to say uh, this derivation? What conclusion can I draw from this derivation? Nothing. Why? Let us say one pole is in the right of complex plane, right? One sigma L is greater than 0. So, what will that imply? Uh, I will I will only be able to conclude in uh, the magnitude of P of T is less than or equal to infinity. That does not help me. That does not tell me it is unstable, right? Is it? See, 0 is also less than infinity. You know, like any other positive number is also less than or equal to infinity, right? Less than infinity, you know? So, it really does not help me. All right. So, what we have shown is only sufficiency. Okay. What about necessary condition? Okay. I leave it to your homework. Okay. You, it's not. Once again, it's not necessary as far as this course is concerned. Okay. But for those who are mathematically inclined, please go and look at the proof. Okay. So, it's available in many standard textbooks. Okay. On controls. So, uh, I hope my point is clear. Right. What we have shown is only sufficiency. Okay. It so turns out that it's also a necessary condition. Okay, so let me uh, 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 what to say Lee, uh, uh, pose that question: uh, Is this que condition necessary? What do I mean by is this condition all poles uh, in LHP necessary for Bibo stability? The answer is yes. And that is why if we do not, if we even have one pole lying in the RHP or on the imaginary axis, the system is not Bibo stable. Okay? That we have shown through examples. right? See, to disprove Bibo stability, I need to figure out only one bounded input for which the output is, is unbounded. We have already shown it. Okay? Whether we call it critically stable, marginally stable or whatever it is, but then we found that it violates Bibo stability definition. And if you have a pole on the a pole in the right of plane, you give me any bounded input, the output will be unbounded. Okay, that is that is sure. If you give repeating poles on the imaginary axis, any bounded input will lead to unbounded output. If you have what are called like non-repeating poles on the imaginary axis, you can always find one bounded input for which the output will be unbounded. Right? The, so that is why this is also the how do we conclude? Because this is also necessary. See, I went from examples to a generic conclusion. The best way to do it is always to prove the generic one and then like do the examples. Okay? But uh, since this is the first course on controls, you know, like I wanted to do examples to motivate our understanding and then like we did the general derivation. Right? So, this I leave it as homework. Okay? The answer is yes. Okay, you need, it is also necessary. That is why we are able to conclude that even if one pole lies in the right of plane, the system is not Bibo stable. Okay? And if we have non-repeating poles on the imaginary axis, once again, you know, like to me it is Bibo unstable, right? Because like I can always find one bounded input for which the system output is unbounded, right? So, although many textbooks will call it as uh, critically stable or marginally stable, that is because of another notion of stability. Okay? So, uh, what I will do is that maybe this is a good place to stop okay? so that you can digest all this information. right?